Good. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Emerging Applications in Preclinical Micro-CT Imaging. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment. Their dedicated team of 8,000 employees worldwide are passionate about providing customers with an unmatched experience as they help solve critical issues in human and environmental health. Perkin Elmer's innovative detection, imaging, informatics, and service capabilities, combined with a deep market knowledge and expertise, help customers gain greater insights into their science to better protect our environment, our food supply, and the health for our families. For more information, please visit www.perkinelmer.com. Before we begin, just a couple of important announcements. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would like to now introduce today's speakers. We have two speakers today, Chris DeMosi and Dr. Gail Rochefort. Speaking first today will be Chris DeMosi. Christopher DeMosi is the Senior Staff Officer, Imaging Scientist and Manager of the Columbia University Small Animal Imaging Shared Resource at the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. After receiving his bachelor's from Fairleigh Dickinson University in 2001, Chris DeMosi started working at the Garden State Cancer Center and the Center for Molecular Medicine and Immunology. He then moved to IMCLONE Systems and then Eli Lilly and Company, focusing on preclinical experimental therapeutics and their monoclonal antibody platforms. He has also worked as part of the teams that brought a number of breakthrough drugs to market, specifically Herbitux and Ceramza. In his current role at Columbia, he mentors the next generations of research scientists throughout the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center, teaching the benefits of non-invasive imaging like MRI, CT, ultrasound, and optical for their ongoing longitudinal imaging studies. I will now turn it over to Chris for his presentation. Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Christy said, my name is uh, Chris DeMosi, and uh, I'm going to discuss today, uh, we're going to work on uh, PDA cachexia. So uh, PDA is uh, uh, ductal adeno uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So we're going to look at uh, pancreatic tumors, uh, specifically how uh, the, our Perkin-Elmer quantum FX uh, micro-CT is being utilized in the research and study of uh, some of the effects of these cancers. So, well, as, as Christy was saying, I work at the Columbia University uh, Small Animal Imaging Shared Resource. Uh, we are a core facility for Columbia University Medical Center, and we research uh, many, uh, many preclinical cancer treatments. We also do uh, diabetic work, uh, cardiology work, uh, neuroscience as well. Uh, we, are, we have high field uh, magnetic resonance imager, uh, a bench top, uh, the quantum effects micro CT. Uh, the IVIS optical imaging system, an ultrasound, and we're actually uh, getting a test system soon, too. And uh, as I said, we're located at Columbia University Medical Center in New York Presbyterian Hospital here in New York. So uh, just to show uh, our, our 
uh, specific Perkinelmer quantum effects. Uh, Micro CT uh, is located on the uh, in the animal facility here at uh, the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we've been utilizing it for a little over two years now. And some of the things that we do, just to give you a quick uh, run through of uh, the different modalities and methodologies that we have available, uh, are are very very robust. It's not just bones, as they say. So uh, we do a lot of soft tissue imaging with, with the quantum, and in this case, we're looking at uh, uh, some lung tissue images. Uh, what was done with this uh, specific study was one of our uh, investigators was working on uh, inflammation and infection of uh, the lungs from uh, bacteria. So you'll see that uh, the right lung versus the left lung has a very different uh, uh, structure and actual uh, Actually, it's kind of clogged up with uh, with lots of inflammation. So that's one of the things that one of our uh, our, our PIs are doing here. Uh, another thing is multimodal modal imaging. So we also have, as I said before, the IBIS uh, term optical imaging system. And the nice thing is we do a lot of co-registration with the micro CT here and the IBIS optical system, where in a lot of cases we are looking at, let's say, lung lung metastasis and we're able to locate them, register them within some of our uh, studies that are going longitudinally. As you can see here, there's also bone that uh, for one of the studies that we've done. Uh, one of the other things that we've done is actual full lung volumes, where we've, this is actually an image from one of our, uh, one of our studies, uh, where we've looked at radiation treatments on the lungs and how they affect uh, lung uh, the lung structure and health over time. Uh, that's, there's many, many things that you can do with RCT. Uh, again, as pretty much everybody knows, there's a lot of uh, excellent uses for the CT with uh, bone structure and density and looking at uh, uh, the microvasculature and micro uh, areas of the, of the bone. Uh, one of the great things and the things that I actually focus on is using, doing uh, pancreatic imaging. So one of the things we've done in the past is to use nanoparticles uh, to see the uh, blood vessel structure of the, of, of the mouse. And in many cases, we were able to actually see where the pancreatic tumor is. This one was a very large one, so we used it as a good example, uh, where there's less uh, vasculature within the, the, the actual tumor. So there's many, many things you can see using a CT. Uh, we we're also looking at uh, uh, using nanoparticles to follow longitudinally uh, uh, liver metastases, and this is an example of how we can uh, see the liver mess that existed within uh, a mouse that had, had obviously liver hepatoblastoma. Uh, also, something we're doing a lot with the uh, diabetes center actually is measuring liver steatosis. So we just this is just an example of a sample that we had taken at Vivo where on the left you'll see a healthy liver uh, where you, we were able to get gating of certain thresholds to see the, uh, the fat with, around the liver. And on the right you'll see a very obese mouse that actually had a genetic abnormality to uh, cause liver steatosis, which is uh, the fattening of the liver. And you can see that there is a much greater uh, amount of fat in the liver. So I'm going to move on to what we're, I'm going to talk about today, which is cacaxia. So one of the things that uh, we work on here at Columbia is pancreatic cancer. Um, pancreatic cancer is a, a devastating disease that has a horrible mortality rate. And one of the things that happens with uh, pancreatic cancer is cancer-associated cachexia, which is a complex metabolic syndrome uh, which uh, is characterized by the loss of the muscle or without the loss of fat. So you'll see muscle wasting within uh, the, the bodies of uh, the patients that have this disease. And you cannot reduce it nutritionally. It has it, a poor prognosis for, for the patients at the point at which they are diagnosed with detecting. And frankly, from at research over the past few years, there is really no known pathway and primary factors that uh, for cachexia and how how it's really done and how it's treated. So uh, we're working on uh, finding the factors that cause the muscle thing uh, and 
again, it's been going on for a long time, and it will probably continue for a long time to come. Uh, so some of the implications of cancer-associated cachexia, as I said before, are decreased survival, reduced response to chemotherapeutics, and reduced quality of life due to the functional and physiological effects of, of basically your muscles wasting away. It's closely related to many other symptoms of cancer, including anorexia, fatigue, long weight loss, and weakness. Uh, the incidence of cancer-associated cachexia is very high in gastrointestinal malignancies, and why we're studying it especially high in pancreatic cancer, specifically up to 80% of, of the people that have uh, advanced pancreatic cancers do uh, come down with cancer-associated cachexia. Uh, one of the things that we're hypothesizing is cachexia is related to drivers within the tumor and stromal environment uh, and are secreted, they are secreted in circulating signals. So one of the things we would like to find and what we've been working on is how to actually see the beginning of cachexia with within a preclinical uh, research and how to then test blood tests or the tissues to see if there are factors that are going forward. So first we have to identify uh, cachexia. Okay. Uh, so I work with uh, the Ken Olive Lab here at Columbia University. And one of the things they focus on is pancreatic duct ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, they have a genetically engineered KPC mouse model uh, which uh, is clinically relevant to uh, the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas, and also the mice here uh, receive cancer, uh, or receive, well, they are diagnosed with cancer associated cachexia once the PDAs are present within the animal. They run a mouse hospital, and that mouse hospital is, is a, an amazing facility that they have here at Columbia. They recreate all the aspects of the clinical trial using mouse model of cancer. So what they do is uh, the model itself is spontaneous. They test the animals uh, ultrasound to make sure that they see the beginning mice it, uh, be enrolled in a phase one or phase two trial. And they recapitulate the and uh, being as close as possible. How do we measure cachexia? Uh, there are actually measure cachexia paths. Uh, one of them is the um, X-ray absorptometry. The problem that we have run into as in doing the studies that we would like to do is that it's not possible to really. the dose of of X, uh, the dose of x-rays is so high that it's a terminal procedure, so it only can be done at the end of the study. And if we want to follow along the, the to measure the, the volume of muscle within an animal, uh, that's not possible to obviously do using this. So what we have is uh, using the CT, uh, that the um, quantum FX micro CT that we have here to actually do longitudinal studies because some of the things, one of the, one of the great pros of the micro CT is the lack of uh, the high dose of x-ray. So we were doing some research and we, were, we, we showed that CTs can be used in humans to uh, then correlate to the DEXA measurements for, for lean body mass or muscle mass, as you would say. Uh, so what people have done in humans is to actually show that if you take a single slice of the CT at the third lumbar, uh, you're to actually measurement using a, a functional quantification, uh, functional equation to actually equal the total body free mass and total body fat mass of, of that uh, patient. The question that we ran into is, okay, so we have a, an idea of uh, uh, an equation that we can start with. Uh, our question is how do we uh, correlate this or how do we transfer this to mice? So obviously uh, human and mice are, are different in scale if not everything else. Uh, uh, we have to find uh, an actual way to make that equation work for animals. So in our research one of the things that we did was uh, specifically from uh, a paper by uh, research 
is, oh, well, this is actually talking about uh, of the human. So how can we re recapitulate this in a human setting, or in a mouse setting? Uh, we found a paper uh, in sensors in 2015 that they correlated CT to actually doing uh, quantitative NMR uh, lean mass methods. So from here, we were able to actually uh, have a starting point equation life, which was actually were a really, really great place to, to begin, and we were able to uh, refine and optimize our equation that we would use for being the third lumbar of a mouse, getting a single slice instead of the entire body, and being able to then take that the area of the muscle around the spinal cord, and actually also including the, the uh, abdominal uh, wall, which I will get to later, because that, there's an interesting story with that. Uh, and then we were able to, to then you pop, pop that into the equation and show that we are very, very well correlated with the actual mean mass at the end of the, uh, uh, using the DEXA scan. So some of the, some of the examples of our for CTs using the Perkinelmer quantum effects are shown here. Uh, what we tend to do is look at the third lumbar. going here. And I'm going to just wrap, wrap around here, do my best to show you what the area around uh, the spinal cord that would be muscle and also the area around the abdominal wall here. This is a horrible little uh, Just to give you an example, uh, that's the areas that we would be focusing on actual uh, fat for where is a lean muscle mass at the body of, of the mouse. Uh, one of the things to do is obviously we need to do the image processing. So some of the things, not only are we looking at the lean body mass, we're also looking at the subcutaneous fat mass. One of the great things about uh, the quantum effects is it's fairly easy to analyze the fat mass, the subcutaneous and visceral fat mass within the body of the animal, as you can see here. Uh, there's SOPs and uh, uh, proper ways to go about um, doing this that are pretty prevalent and they can people would know how to do it. It's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward process to get your fat, fat masses whole body of an animal. Uh, so for imaging, the lean slices is a little bit different because you have to you know, um, make sure that you get rid of all of the different uh, other tissues, make sure that they don't connect and add into your area. So one of the things that we do is we create uh, edge strength and, and, and walls within the body of the animal. Uh, allows us to then use some automated processes to get the areas uh, that we are looking for. So when we image a single uh, slice for the lean mass of an animal, uh, it tends to look like this. This is actually a, one of the more difficult animals that that we had to use because there was not a lot of contrast, and I will explain why. Uh, but just wanted to give you an example that was probably a little bit more difficult than the easy one. What we would do is we would create a wall around the area of the um, muscle within the spinal cord. Uh, we would then do thresholding to get the, uh, the, the area within of the muscle mass. We would eliminate the, the spinal cord itself. And we would just showing that we added that in with the subcutaneous and visceral fat mass within uh, this mouse. Uh, so then we simply go and then do in volume analysis. You, uh, we specifically use Analyze Pro here at Columbia, and there's many different uh, analysis programs that are available. They all have their pros, they all have their cons. This is just the one that we settled on. So uh, you would get an area for that, that muscle mass, and then you uh, pop to the equation that we've, uh, we've worked on here, and you're able to get a, a, a very well correlated uh, uh, number of the lean, uh, or lean muscle mass of the animal as, as a whole. But one of the first things we ran into was our first run of data was a little off. And we noticed when you look at it, let's say when you look at this image here, that we are not including uh, the muscle of the abdominal wall, which I'm drawing kind of a line within here. And it may not look like it's a large amount of volume, but it was. So one of the things we went back and recalculated uh, and added in uh, the muscle wall here, as you can see as an example. It's actually very easy to do. There was plenty of contrast. 
because of this um, with the CT, and we didn't actually use a contrast agent, I should say, with these mice. It's just contrast of the tissues compared to the surrounding tissue. So we were able to then add that into the uh, the image uh, and calculate the volume, including that area. And we went in, went ahead and, and did some regions of, region of interest quantification, showing that we were then adding in the abdominal wall of the animal in, uh, into the lean muscle mass quantification. Uh, one of the things, and I was kind of saying this before, is uh, we ran into an issue with uh, ascites mice. So hemorrhagic ascites is also a, a prognosis, an unfortunate prognosis of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, where uh, the abdomen will be filled with uh, some bloody uh, fluid. The problem is, obviously, blood uh, is filled with iodine, uh, <laughs> or not iodine, uh, iron, I should say, excuse me. And uh, it adds to a little bit of, a, causes a little bit of a problem with uh, imaging. So one of the first things we tried was adding in saline to the abdom abdominal cavity. Uh, that was not a, uh, really not effective, as you see by the middle uh, middle image. Uh, so what we actually did was we added a contrast agent uh, to the abdominal cavity by an intraperitoneal injection. And that actually helped uh, tremendously to uh, show us the different organs that we can see throughout the slice. Uh, we were able to find a slice within the third lumbars of, of the majority of the animals uh, where we were able to easily uh, delineate what was the muscle and the abdominal wall versus the surrounding tissues. So there are ways to actually get past these little uh, hurdles that you run into occasionally. But just to sum up uh, what we're currently doing right now, uh, we have over 80 animals that we've uh, run through this, this protocol. Uh, improvements can be made, such as ACIDES uh, running into, uh, optimizing the way to image those animals, uh, having uh, abdominal wall identification be a little bit better. There's a little bit of error in, in, in drawing up the the, uh, the the walls and the areas that we would be imaging. However, uh, the correlation that we've come up with to doing the DEXA scans at the end of the study with with the measurements of uh, of, the, of the muscle mass of the animal uh, is very good. Uh, we still have a couple of outliers that we're trying to figure out why, but uh, it's obviously an ongoing task. Uh, to come is a damaging disease state that needs more investigation and really is not a good uh, model that exists currently and we're hoping that we can show uh, a way to, uh, to take a look at uh, cachexia longitudinally versus just waiting for the physiological to show up which uh, we believe we have found this accurately. Uh, accurate clinically relevant model and a method to longitudinally measure the cancer associated cachexia in a preclinical investigation. And it hopefully will allow us to further delve into the reasons and characteristics of the development of cancer associated cachexia in patients and humans and in our research. Um, I would just like to thank uh, some of the people that uh, I've worked with here uh, Dr. Paul Oberstein, uh, Wilson Hissey. Uh, Steve Sastra and uh, the director of the Small Animal Imaging Shared Resource here at Columbia University, uh, Dr. Ken Allen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Dr. Gail Rochefort. Dr. Gail Rochefort is a professor at the Dental School Faculty, Paris Descartes University. Professor Rochefort joined the EA 2496 Oral Facial Pathologies imaging and biotherapies in 2013. In his current role, he is responsible for managing research aspects regarding tooth regeneration and its supporting tissues, including periodontium and more generally, cranial facial bone. He also plays a key role in developing innovative micro CT methodologies and imaging strategy. Prior to joining EA2496, he gained expertise in bone biology and physiology completing postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada, and the University of Orleans, France. Professor Rochefort holds a PhD in biology and physiology, completing his thesis on vascular tissue engineering using stem cells. Dr. Rochefort? 
Hello everyone, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you today on this webcast. So I'm Gail Rochefort and I will talk to you today about some pre-clinical um, applications that we are developing in the lab uh, using the Perkin-Elmer quantum FX micro CT uh, imaging systems. Uh, in this uh, slide, this first slide, you can see some uh, example of that kind of application. Here uh, we are in uh, dental school faculty, so we do some stuff on the tooth, but also uh, we do some uh, a lot of work on uh, vessels and uh, using some uh, contrast agents. Uh, we will have a look on a lot of uh, beautiful imaging about uh, that kind of uh, work. And uh, also we have uh, a work on soft tissue and uh, like uh, for Chris, it's on lung. And I will talk uh, a little bit on that. So uh, you you all know maybe uh, the properties of the device, the quantum FX device. Uh, in the lab here, we have uh, an FX uh, device. Uh, the, the, the device is managed in the lab by uh, Le Cisimani and uh, you may know that uh, uh, this device has a lot of uh, wonderful, interesting properties. Uh, for, for instance, the first is the fluoroscopy mode. Um, with this uh, mode, uh, you, can, uh, you can easily place the animals inside uh, the, a bed inside the device and you can easily uh, and fastly uh, position uh, the, the animals where you want to have the, the good resolution uh, image after. So it's quite interesting to have that, uh, that kind of mode and it's very fast, it's really interesting. The second is also the, the possibility for a kind of device to, uh, to work with small animals like uh, mice, of course, but rats and uh, maybe also some uh, uh, small rabbits. So uh, we have for that uh, different bed, uh, dedicated bed, and uh, they are all uh, compatible with anesthesia. Uh, so uh, we can do some longitudinal analysis and it's quite interesting to have that kind of, uh, of mode because we can reduce the number of animals and refine our project on that. Uh, the device uh, has the possibility to have uh, high speed imaging, uh, less than 20 seconds for the fastest uh, imaging uh, device, uh, imaging uh, uh, slide. And uh, usually in the lab, we use it at um, uh, three minutes. It's a good uh, compromise between uh, resolution, uh, time, and uh, size uh, of uh, the image. Uh, with that kind of image, we can do uh, uh, between 10 and 15 animals per hour, hour so it's quite good. Um, and what is also uh, wonderful is uh, the high speed analysis of the device. Uh, the trigger processing is really fast, so uh, you can easily have the answer of uh, uh, is it a good image or a bad image? Do we have to redo uh, the scan on that? And uh, within less than one minute, we have the answer. So it's quite interesting. Uh, so uh, we we do a lot of uh, of different project with uh, with the, 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 the device, and uh, the first of them is. Uh, the possibility to, to do some follow-up. And for example, in the lab, uh, Marjolaine Gosset has um, um, a mice uh, line, uh, a KO mice line for, for a chain called uh, ML3. Uh, this chain is coding for um, uh, a protein called uh, name uh, MLRP3, and this protein is involved in the inflammasome. And in uh, her project, she wants to know uh, if uh, there is a link between uh, this protein and the physiological bone modeling and remodeling. So for that, we do uh, a lot of scan on uh, her animals. And uh, we, uh, we do uh, a lot of um, uh, analysis on the trabecular bone at the tibial bone uh, at the proximal metathesis uh, area. And you can see here on the side uh, that uh, there is a huge difference between male and female in the KO, but also in the wild type animals. So uh, we uh, we do uh, that kind of scan, and we do also a follow-up during uh, 16 weeks. 
and uh, you can see here uh, the different results uh, for the bone characteristics uh, for the BVTV, but also the trabecular number and thickness. Uh, you can see that uh, the the K1 animals uh, have a nephropotic uh, phenotype, uh, and this phenotype is more severe in the female KO um, compared to the male KO at the trabecular uh, bone level. We also do uh, that kind of analysis uh, at the uh, alveolar bone uh, here at the mandible. Uh, the alveolar bone is under the molar number one and molar number two, and you have the the picture of the bone alveolar bone for the male and the female uh, in the KO, but also in the wild type animals. And uh, when we look at the results. Uh, we uh, can't see any difference, so no difference between all the animals, all the KO versus the wild type, but also uh, uh, male versus female. So um, in this uh, animal slide, the device uh, allows us to answer the question uh, whether there is, there is any difference uh, between the mice, KO mice, and the wild type mice at the alveolar bone versus the trabecular bone. Another application uh, in the lab uh, using this device is about the soft tissue here, the lung, and we had the opportunity in the lab to work on um, a FRA2 KO transgenic mice. These mice uh, uh, are developing a fibrosis, a pulmonary fibrosis associated with a pulmonary hypertension. And with the device, we uh, were able to calculate uh, the lung uh, volume in the white type versus the, the KO. And um, we were able to also quantify uh, the fibrosis inside the lung and in the, the KO animals. This volume, this fibrotic volume was uh, really increased uh, versus the, the wild type. And the functional uh, respiratory capacity in the KO animals were lower compared to the uh, wild type animals. Um, we also uh, treat these animals, these KO animals, uh, with an antibody and evaluate the effect of the antibody uh, and we were able to uh, to reveal that uh, this antibody uh, was able to rescue uh, the KO phenotype. Uh, that is to say that after the treatment, uh, the KO animals have uh, a kind of uh, normal uh, lung tissue with normal uh, functional respiratory uh, capacity. So that work is now uh, published in PNAS uh, this year. It was a really interesting work. Another application uh, using that uh, device uh, here is uh, the, a lot of works from uh, Jeremy Sadwan. Uh, Jeremy has done a very wonderful work using uh, contrast agents, and uh, he was um, was really uh, involved in that because he has done a lot of scan to uh, to see the whole body uh, vessels in mice, as you can see in the bottom of the, the slide. Uh, when we play with the, with the threshold on the whole body uh, reconstruction, we can see, uh, of course, the whole body, but also the soft tissue, the heart tissue, and also all the vasculature. He has done also a kind of magnification, and, and um, the top of the slide, we can see um, a reconstruction around the mandibles, and you can see the, the network, the vessel network, the vasculature network uh, inside, but also outside the, the mandibles. So uh, he has done uh, that kind of work with, with uh, barium sulfate. And you can see that uh, with, uh, with this compound, with this agent, uh, we can uh, do some wonderful imaging of the uh, vessels, of the vascular network at the head also but also uh, at the hip level, uh, inside and outside bones. So uh, sometimes it's quite interesting to have uh, the information of the vasculature inside bone. And with this compound, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to have the answer. 
unfortunately this compound is uh, lethal so that means that uh, we cannot do uh, any longitudinal uh, follow-up with, uh, with this compound. So uh, Jeremy uh, tried to find uh, some uh, non-lethal agents and he has done a, a wonderful work on, uh, on several agents to, to find the best of them. Uh, here you have some, uh, some image uh, at the heart and lung level and uh, when he used the Omnipact, uh, he was able, of course, to see the vasculature, the vascular network around the heart, inside the heart and uh, the lung. But uh, the, the vessels were uh, bigger than expected because of extra uh, vasification. So uh, he also uh, has done this work with Exia at uh, a dose of 5 microliters per gram of animals. Uh, images were better, but um, they were uh, noisy. And we, when we uh, increased the dose at 10 microliters per gram of animal, it was really better. But uh, unfortunately, it was lethal for the animals. Uh, so uh, he also uh, done that work with Exciton, Exciton Nano, and with uh, this uh, agent. Uh, he can easily see uh, all the vasculature with accurate size and shape. Uh, the same things was done uh, with the liver and uh, the same results with the same conclusion was observed. So uh, extra, extra vasculation with Omnipac, uh, a kind of noisy shape uh, with uh, exia at uh, 5 microliters. Uh, a better um, rendering with exia at 10 microliters, but also uh, little. Um, and exitron nano was really better. Um, he also has done that uh, at the kidney, and uh, the same uh, the same thing was observed. Um, you can see with Exciton Nano that uh, at the kidney level we can observe a wonderful uh, vascular network and this was not uh, exactly the same and with uh, the other compound. So uh, for for these three uh, tissue and area, uh, Exciton Nano uh, could be the best. At last, he also uh, has done the job at the orofacial area. Um, and uh, also the, the same results was, uh, was really observed. Uh, so maybe uh, the Exitron Nano uh, could be the best uh, to use when we want to, to, uh, to have any follow-up with animals. But uh, also Exia here, especially at this area, at the Orofacial area, uh, when we use it at the uh, concentration or at the dose at uh, 5 microliters per gram. Um, so another application of that kind of uh, vascular uh, contrast agent uh, was, uh, was done by a PhD student in the lab, Caroline Gorin. Uh, Caroline is, uh, is uh, um, a dentist, and uh, she has done uh, a lot of works on a pulp injury. So in dentistry, when we have a pulp injury, uh, the treatment is an endodontic treatment. Uh, that means that the patient has to um, has to remove the pulp inside the tooth. So he remove everything that is vital uh, in the tooth, and after that, uh, the tooth is dead. Uh, so the future treatment uh, wants to play uh, with that and wants to uh, preserve the tooth uh, vitality. And uh, to do that, uh, we can do uh, some tissue engineering using uh, pulp tissue and using uh, stem cells. So uh, Caroline uh, has extract stem cells from the tooth. Uh, these stem cells has, um, have a kind of mesenchymal stem cells property that means that they have high proliferation, high plasticity, uh, regenerative potential also. Uh, these uh, stem cells were extracted by Caroline. Uh, she put them in a collagen matrix, put everything in a tooth slime, um, treat it 
or not uh, by hypoxia and uh, by surgery and uh, implant everything in the back of a mouse. And after uh, uh, three weeks, uh, she wanted to know if the, the site uh, was, uh, uh, if there is any vessels inside the site, inside the, the slice. So uh, for that, she first has done some echography uh, and uh, you can see uh, some image of that. Uh, in red or in yellow, you have the vessels and you have a larger number of the cells uh, when the cells were protected by hypoxia compared to the normoxia protected cells. Uh, these results were uh, confirmed by a PET scan using K5. K5 is targeting neuroangiogenic disease. Uh, so uh, she also has done uh, the, the same uh, with uh, CT and of course uh, she used the, the um, contrast agent developed by uh, Jeremy uh, to, to confirm that. And you can see on uh, that kind of picture that there is a huge increase uh, in the epoxy protected uh, tooth slide compared to the normoxic created slide. So uh, with the device, with the micro CT and the vascular contrast agent, uh, she was able to, uh, to, to see that epoxia is promoting oncogenesis in our project. Uh, these, uh, these results are now published in uh, stem cells translational medicine uh, this year. Uh, of course, she has done uh, a lot of confirmation of all that, a lot of immunochemistry and so on. And here you have an example of uh, acting uh, immunochemistry to confirm that uh, there is an increase uh, by hypoxia of the number of uh, uh, vessels inside the tooth slide. Uh, another application uh, done by a PhD student in the lab, uh, Frédéric Chamier, it's uh, about also uh, dental pulp stem cells, but uh, from rats that time. And she, he has done a critical size defects uh, at the calvaria level in the, in the rat. And uh, he put uh, stem cells inside uh, uh, collagen matrix and inside the, the defects. And he wanted to know um, over the time uh, if the, the cells help the bone uh, regeneration. So using the device, we were able uh, with him uh, to, to evidence that uh, the matrix with the cells were able to promote bone generation compared to, uh, to the matrix without cells or compared to uh, without matrix. And that was able uh, uh, using the device and using a longitudinal uh, follow-up in the rat. The same results, but in the mouse, uh, have been done by also a PhD student, uh, and Margot Collignon here. So in the mouse, it's quite uh, not the same timing. And here we have to wait uh, over uh, three months to have a kind of bone regeneration, but uh, she was able to, to see exactly the same results. That is to say that when we use uh, cells, uh, the bone regeneration is uh, much better than uh, without cells. So uh, to, to conclude about uh, all that, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we use the device, uh, we are able to, to do a lot of imaging, uh, ex vivo, but also in vivo. And it's really important to, to, to do a lot of in vivo imaging. And the follow-up is really interesting with that kind of device because we can really reduce the number of animals. Uh, we can really reduce uh, and refine our protocol. And we can really uh, uh, increase uh, the understanding of our project. Um, to, to finish, I'd like uh, really to thank all the people uh, here, and maybe I forgot a lot of people. Uh, really, I want to, to thank um, uh, also Patty and Mel for promoting this, this uh, webcast, and also LabRoots uh, for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rochefort. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, 
which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is for Chris. Chris, you mentioned some research that focuses on radiation effects on the lung during cancer therapy. Could you speak a little bit about the importance of minimizing CT dose in those longitudinal studies? Uh, sure, absolutely. So one of the things uh, that we wanted to do primarily was to be able to follow along an animal that was dosed with radiation into one of its lungs versus a healthy lung on, on the other side. Uh, we have an instrument here at Columbia called the SARP, which is uh, basically a surgically targeted radiation uh, in here so that you're able to actually just target one lung versus both with radiation. But the most important thing for us was we did not want to affect uh, uh, any of the, uh, the physiological health of the animal going forward. And we wanted to take uh, images as many times as possible uh, going forward to see how there was changes in the lung function and the lung uh, 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 health. Uh, one of the great things about uh, the, the micro CT, the uh, quantum effects that we use, is it actually has a really, really low uh, 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 dose of, of, of radiation. Uh, so as an example, for some of the images that we took with the lungs, uh, they usually were dosed uh, for each image around you know, like 15 milligray. So you're able, to, and one of the one of our uh, uh, things that we we put into our protocols is we would never dose over a full gray of accumulated uh, radiation dose uh, for for the animal. So it allows us to do many many different images over a longer period of time. So it's very important to minimize the CT dose in these longitudinal studies so you can get more images to lengthen out your ability to uh, do a long-term research study on an animal uh, such as this. Thank you. Gail, do you um, mind commenting on the importance of minimizing CT dose in longitudinal studies also? Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course, it's really important to have uh, to to monitor uh, the dose uh, for each scan, but also during the longitudinal study. And with uh, with the device, we have um, a kind of approximate uh, dose for each scan. Uh, so uh, usually we use uh, the the three minute scan, uh, and it's around uh, one thousand milligray per per scan. Uh, so uh, we can um, really uh, monitor each uh, scan with each animal and uh, also uh, during the time. Uh, and it's really important to, to, to have that kind of uh, uh, things in mind uh, for, for the animals, yeah, sure. This question is for Gail and Chris. Could you comment on the use of contrast agents in your models? Are you utilizing clinical or preclinical agents? And are there specific models when you see the real advantage of using? Uh, so for me, from it's with Gail, uh, we use a preclinical uh, agents. Uh, some of them, or most of them, are not clinical agents. Uh, I think they are not allowed to be used in human or so. Uh, so we use it uh, only in the clinical uh, manner. Um, I, I would agree with Gail. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the things that we're using are preclinical, uh, such as the Exitron Nano uh, Gold nanoparticles, uh, which we use for vascular studies. Uh, we also do use Omnipake, which is a clinical uh, 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 contrast agent, and that is used for there's a multitude of uses for it. Uh, in the animal, it's fast to uh, clear that most of them are, uh, it's very good at uh, going to the kidney because that's basically, it bears so fast, it's really not uh, uh, and useful for much else. But actually, what we found is if we dose, uh, as, as an example, where we found uh, we were having issues with hemorrhagic ascites, mice, and not being able to image those animals, if we dose intraperitoneally with omni you're actually able to use it as a negative contrast, sort of like an opposite of how you would normally see it 
uh, uh, the opposite of how it would be used uh, in an IV setting, uh, where it would, would be much brighter than the tissues, and you're able to then look at the tissues uh, at, at a darker threshold. So that's one of the things you do. So we kind of use both uh, preclinical and clinical. I agree, yes. Dr. Rushford, did you say that the dose of 5 ULG of Exia 160XL contrast is non-lethal? So using uh, that kind of uh, product and the uh, recommended dose uh, at 5, uh, it's uh, non-lethal, so uh, no problem with, uh, with the animals, but uh, the the contrast is really poor and uh, a lot of noise uh, is observed around the vessel. So uh, uh, even if the dose is the good dose, uh, the the rendering is not really um, here. So that's why we we try uh, to increase the dose uh, at at ten and at ten. Uh, unfortunately, the compound is a little for the animals, right? Here. And Chris, Gale, have either of you used this agent? Any comment on that? I personally have not used the, uh, the, XI, the XI, X, EXIA uh, 160XL contract. Very good. And concerning fat imaging, did you try osmium textroxide text as contrast agent, Exivo? Would that be? Um, no. Uh, yeah, so in, uh, we actually, uh, here at Columbia, we haven't used osmium tetroxide for uh, fat imaging. Uh, we've used it for bone imaging, actually, uh, the fat within the bone. Uh, uh, the only time that uh, we, we actually never really run into any issues being able to measure the visceral and subcutaneous fat, that's actually a fairly straightforward thresholding with the uh, quantum effects micro CT, the imaging is a very good contrast with that. So there's certain thresholds that we've already established that have, with our SLPs here that you just do a whole body image of the animal and we're able to threshold out and uh, wall out the subcutaneous and visceral fat fairly easily without having to do the contrast. Chris, this question is for you. Why use a single slice when you can do full 3D via conical beam CT? Uh, that's, uh, I would say that's probably the, the hardest part about uh, doing a, having a CT, uh, using CT as a, an imaging technology is actually the analysis, right? The imaging is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's the analysis afterwards. I would say that's probably because there's a in the ability of a person. We're looking to do, one of the things that we were looking to do was to limit the amount of time somebody has to sit in front of the computer uh, for a single animal. So if we were to do a whole body image, and we would have to wall out basically a, a large number of surrounding tissues to make sure that the thresholds didn't expand into uh, some tissues that might be uh, uh, butting against. Uh, the spinal muscle or the abdominal wall. So one of the things, and this is also why they do it in humans, is to uh, be able to just get from that one slice. It, it, it's fairly easy to just uh, wall out those areas and image uh, or and get the quantification of from a single slice versus the many hundreds of slides, the slices that actually exist with the CT because it's so highly uh, uh, re the high the high resolution. There's such a high amount of slices. So I would say that the reason is is uh, expediency when you're doing 60 mice uh, at, at a time. Uh, that would be an inordinate amount of uh, uh, time spent on uh, a single mouse uh, to do the entire body like that. And this is kind of one of the reasons that we went forward to do this, was to also save uh, uh, an analysis that didn't need to be done. And this question, again, is for both of you. Could you talk a little about cardiac respiratory gating for lung imaging, for example, for measuring lung air volume measurements? So yes, uh, for, for the lung imaging, but also for the heart imaging, uh, we use uh, that kind of gating. And uh, the, the device uh, is able to analyze the 
the air flag uh, movement and uh, it's able to extract uh, the uh, stolic to the diastolic uh, movement of the heart but also the movement of the chest and uh, with that we do not do not have any noise in the 3D uh, rendering so uh, anytime we have to, to work on uh, living animals and on this part of the, the body uh, we have to use that kind of device yes right um, Gail explained it perfectly uh, when we're looking at the lungs uh, specifically to do um, air volume within the lungs you need to make sure that you gate for uh, the respira respirations and uh, in some cases if you want to get very high resolution cardiac gating. The nice thing about the quantum effects that we have here is it has both cardiac and respiratory gating. It's very simple it extends the image of, uh, uh, time just a little bit because it actually does it twice in, in, in a way uh, but it actually is really excellent with uh, gating for the movement of the breath and uh, the heart. That's all the time we have for today. I would like to once again thank Chris DeMosi and Dr. Gail Rochefort for their presentation. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 24, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.